Good evening. Good evening, everyone. And welcome. I bring you warm regards from Jerusalem, where I was just this morning. And I just came back this uh, late afternoon. The wonders of uh, air travel and communications. So uh, I left last Thursday after the class, and now I'm here. And uh, in the streets of Jerusalem, they are preparing for a Purim. As we are here, but they have a special Purim this year going to three, it's called a triple Purim. Purim is Shulish, according to the laws. See, for Jerusalem, because it's a walled city, so Purim is celebrated on the 15th of Adar, which is Shabbos this year. Because of Shabbos, there's all kinds of complicated laws, intricate laws, where the, they read the Megillah on Friday, and they uh, give out the gifts to the poor on Friday. But the meal and the Shalach Manas, the gifts of food, all happen on Sunday. So they have this triple day of the triple Purim. I wish I could have been there, but I had to be back with all of you lovely people. And uh, even though with the wonders of webcasts, but um, that's how it is. So I guess we're all connected, so I bring you warm regards, as I say, from there. Very inspiring to uh, sit in the streets of Jerusalem um, and just meet uh, many different uh, Jews of all walks of life. And uh, I think it's a good segue to address being that tonight begins... Well, tomorrow morning, tonight leads in tomorrow morning, tomorrow to the fast of Esther, which is a preparation to Purim itself, which will be on Friday here. And then uh, Shushan Purim, as I said, which is the Purim in Jerusalem and other walled cities. So I think it's a good segue. Um, the context being, is where we define the topic of this week's class to be connecting the dots seeing the, the divine patterns in your life. Because one of the more fascinating elements of Purim's story, when you read the Megillah, which consists of nine chapters, and many people do not know this, is that the story of the Megillah did not take place over a short period of time. It took place over a period of seven, nine years, actually. From the time when King when Ahasuerus became king, was crowned king, until the last sentences, the last verses in the Megillah, is a period of nine years. The Megillah tells it in a compact way, and in retrospect, you see the story as a pattern. But if you actually live then, nine years is a long time in the, when you're living through it. So yes, the first year you have King Ahasuerus becomes king of Persia. As the Megillah begins... They ruled over 127 lands. It was essentially a superpower. The Persian Empire at the time conquered the Babylonian Empire before it. And the Persian Empire, as the, as the Megillah describes, it's spanned from Haidu at Kush. Haidu is India. And Kush is usually interpreted as Ethiopia. So essentially think of it the whole peninsula from India, which is Central Asia, all the way through the Middle East, all the way to Africa, which was, of course, then at the time, the major population centers of the world, ancient Mesopotamia, and many of the superpowers of the time, um, this, was the, this was the main control. Europe had not yet emerged as a major force. That would happen later with the Romans, with the Greeks, and then the Romans. The Persian Empire, which precedes the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire is still at a state where, as I said, the main, the main center, population centers, main culture as it was developing, was in these countries. Mahaydu had 127 different countries. And that's what Ahasuerus uh, controlled as the king, as the Megillah opens up. And then the story continues, that Ahasuerus, to honor his own himself and his uh, reign as king, uh, calls a big feast big feast, and the Megillah begins the story in detail of the feast, how people from all different, uh, to, to celebrate his uh, control of all these kingdoms, of all these countries, how people from different backgrounds and different races and cultures all became part of uh, this feast. They were all invited. 
Achishreish made sure to cater to each of their needs, which clearly suggests that their needs were very diverse, because you can imagine countries ranging from India all the way to Ethiopia, all the way to Africa, had different customs, different foods, different traditions, and all this was being celebrated by Achishreish as, the, as I said, the Megillah opens up. And then the story continues that as Achishreish got his his, his heart, the way the, the Megillah has its own tongue-in-cheek type of uh, language, it's in Hebrew, it's a little, uh, also a little Persian, and um, and Achishverosh, Tev Lev Amel of Mishta Bayayin, the king's heart became so-called a little uh, light-headed with wine. So at that point, he decides to summon his bride, his wife Vashti, the queen Vashti. Now, just to uh, juice it up a little, well, not to juice it up, but to give you the juicy side of it, Vashti was actually the one that had true um, aristocratic uh, lineage. Because she was a granddaughter and uh, came all the way from Nebuchadnezzar and from Balshetzer and from the, the real Babylonian kings. Achashverosh, on the other hand, was an upstart. He did not really have uh, um, that type of... He didn't have uh, the blue blood, as they say. So it wasn't so... Vashti, you can imagine, in some way, did not necessarily see her husband and her, the king as as a pure and uh, a pure king as, as she saw herself. But he summoned her to show her off her beauty to the others. And some say he summoned her to come in the nude. Some say it was just in general to uh, in some way humiliate her. So basically she refused to come, as the Megillah tells the story. She refused to come, so Achishver gets angry because it, it, it ends up embarrassing him. And one of his advisors who ends up being Haman, at that time he's still called Mamuchan, one of his advisors, suggests to Achishverosh that you cannot let her get away with this because it's going to be a, 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 a precedent, it'll set a precedent that women will defy their husbands. So this issue goes back a long time, the whole feminist issue is also addressed in the Megillah, and as a result, Haman suggests, the advisor suggests to Achishverosh that you should have her killed, which he does. In his anger, in his wrath, in the moment of, uh, of his drunkenness, he has her killed. And then, of course, he's left without a queen. So the story continues. The search for the new queen and the different women who were brought to him from all over, the, from all the kingdoms. And to make the long story short, he ends up choosing Esther. Not knowing that she was Jewish, she hid the fact. She was a niece or different uh, opinions, but she was some relative to Mordechai. And uh, she chose her. As I said, all this is happening. Not, they don't happen. It's not happening in one day. As I said, it's a, not, a period of nine years. I'm just giving you the milestones. The Megillah just points out the things that are relevant to the story. So, he, she, so Esther becomes queen of, of Persia, of this large kingdom. And then the story continues that one day there were two people plotting. Two people plotting to take the king's life. They were speaking in a language that was very foreign. Mordechai, who was another advisor, and spent time in the courtyard of the king, overhears this plot. And since he was familiar with many different languages, including many obscure languages, he understood what they, what they were saying, and he informs the king, Achashverosh, and his uh, people. And these two, and the plot is thwart, thwarted, Achashverosh's life is saved, and these two are killed as well. And then the story continues. Hamordechai, as a result, the stature rises. But above all, Haman suddenly comes on the scene as Haman is being the main advisor of the king. And Haman was, was uh, honored and feared by everyone there. And the, Torah, and the Megillah continues that everyone would bow to Haman except Mordechai. Mordechai refused to bow to Haman. So the Megillah tells the story that Haman became infuriated by that. He knew he was a Jew. So he starts looking for ways to get even with the Jew and with all the Jews. Now clearly it wasn't just that, Haman, that Mordechai didn't bow once to him, it was this whole attitude. He was a, an anti-Semite, in the classic sense of the word. And he, would, and, and he, long before Hitler, essentially plans the first genocide of the Jews. You could argue Pharaoh also did that, but Pharaoh didn't kill all the Jews. He, he enslaved them. But here he actually plots the geno their, 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 their extermination. And the story continues how, Morde how uh, Haman throws lots. He believed in the mazel and so on, and he throws lots and finally determines 
that the day the decree is the month of Adar, which is the month in which we are in now. And especially what influenced him was he discovers that that month was the month when um, Moses passed, died, passed away. So he saw it as a bad omen for the Jews that Moses, the great Moses, the first prophet, the first leader of the Jews, died in that month. He thought it was a good month to choose. As the Talmud says, the only thing he was that he, did, he also didn't realize Moses was also born that month. But that's, as I, as I said, on the side right now, for now. Maybe we'll discuss that later. Anyway, um, so now the decree has been passed. And this wasn't a small matter because this wasn't one small kingdom. As I mentioned, all people that lived, basically every Jew that existed at that time in history was under the control of uh, Hashverosh, the king of Persia. So this uh, decree was about all the Jews, not one and not two, and not a small group. And since every Jew would, been, would have been killed, that Adar, according to Haman's plan, plan, plot. And then the story continues how uh, one night the king is asleep and uh, he's restless. He has insomnia. And in middle of his insomnia, like the good old, what do you do when, uh, when someone can't sleep? When children can't sleep, you read stories to them. So the king had a story reader coming to him who would read to soothe him and put him to sleep. And they read the story. They read the story, what happened several years earlier, where Mordechai had thwarted the plot to take the king's life. So the king suddenly awakens a certain desire to reward Mordechai. And the story continues how Haman is the person in the courtyard and he's summoned by the king. And the king asks him, what would you do to reward someone that has uh, pleased the king. So Haman was convinced the king was talking about him. So he, he came up with a very elaborate uh, plan of how you honor someone. You give him the king's horse and you dress him in the king's garments and you march him through the city and you say, here's a man that the king uh, uh, wants to honor. You know, he, he, uh, you know, he thought it was all about him. Little did he know, and he finds out a few minutes later that the king says, everything you just said, I'd like you to do to Mordechai. And uh, you should be the one that leads Mordechai through the streets and do exactly as you just specified. So Haman was left in that humiliated situation where he had to just do to Mordechai, the person he hated so much, exactly what he thought we'd done to himself. Anyway, more time passes. Um, the next uh, scene of the Megillah is Esther finally and, and covertly discussing with Mordechai what should be done. So she suggests to Mordechai, gather the Jews together, Leich Kneis Kol Yehudim, gather all the Jews together, let them pray, let them fast for three days, and, uh, and I will see what I can do. And they have their discussions, which every sentence has many, layer, many themes. I'm just giving you the outline of it, and you'll see all this, as I said, is a nine-year period. So at this point, Esther finally decides that she's going to... Uh, schedule a uh, meal, special, she's going to host a special meal for, special, for, for her husband, the king, and Haman, the great advisor. And Haman, of course, is honored to be at this meal, only that the queen is hosting for him and, uh, for Haman and Nachashverosh. And then there's another meal, and all this is a plot for Hester to finally um, arouse the, the warmth and the good feelings of the king to... to tell the king that Haman wants to destroy her and her nation. And once that's discovered, Haman comes pleading to her for mercy. And the king sees that and he thinks that he's trying to, he's trying to come on to her, the queen, in his own, in, in his own palace. And his, uh, the wrath is incurred of the kings and he has Haman hung. That wasn't enough because the decree was already passed. In 127 countries, they already had received a decree that the Jews should be killed. So the fact that Haman was hung uh, didn't necessarily uh, reverse the decree. So now began a whole new effort. Just for the record, when was Haman hung was on Passover. I'm just mentioning this because many people miss this point. They think that Haman being hung and Haman being conquered was enough. It wasn't enough. That happened on Passover. That's not what we celebrate, Purim. Purim is eight and nine, 11 months later that the decree was reversed, that Esther was able to convince the king to, de to reverse the decree, 
That was the ultimate celebration that we celebrate on Purim. So you could say the beginning of it was, of course, Haman being killed. But the, the, the Purim that we celebrate is actually 11 months later when finally the decree, the decree is reversed. And instead of it being a day of disaster and, and tragedy, it becomes a day, as the Megillah says, of Yemei Sosun V'Simcha, a day of great celebration and joy. And as the Megillah says more than once, a month it becomes a month and a day that everything was transformed. The word v'napachu is used. Nepach lehem, twice. Nepach in Hebrew means to be reversed, transformed. It's one thing you can say something bad was going to happen and you neutralized it, it's not happening. But to say that something bad turns into something great, that's a transformation, that you actually took the darkness and turned it into light. So Megillah defines Purim as being essentially a transfer day of transformation. You'll see all this will be relevant in our discussion this evening. And the transformation is that not only was the decree abolished, it was a, but it actually turned into a great holiday. And this is the Purim holiday that we celebrate till this very day, where uh, we uh, um, celebrate it with, as I mentioned before briefly, through different mitzvahs that are all mentioned in the Megillah, gifts of food to each other, Matana Slav which is uh, gifts to the poor of money, a suda, a meal, a festive meal, we read the Megillah, Hallel is said, I'm different, and uh, generally it's a, it's considered to be a holiday. Though it's not a holiday, for instance, that is permit, prohibited to do work, let's say Passover or Sukkot or Shavuos, and definitely not like Shabbos, but it's still nevertheless a holiday. And it's a great holiday. It's considered to be one of the greatest holidays to the point where, yes, uh, you um, celebrate Adela Yada is the expression till the point that it's beyond limits, beyond any type of finite celebration. And that's Purim. And then the end of the story in the Megillah is that how uh, Esther and Achishverish prevail over the king to designate, designate this day as a holiday and allow the Jews to celebrate in Shushan and the neighboring uh, cities and countries and villages. And then how they um, also appeal to the Sanhedrin, to the court, Jewish court, to turn this into a formal holiday. A Megillah should be read, that we formally read it, the Megillah. It should become part of the, the Tanakh. And the Gil- Esther, the Book of Esther, becomes part of the biblical canon. So when we talk about the, the we have the Bible, and we have the, the prophets and the writings, Esther is one of those books, like the Book of Psalms, the Book of Job, the Book of Proverbs, Shir Hashirim, they're all part of, the, part of Torah. This is another achievement. And finally, the end conclusion is how Mordechai was rewarded to be a uh, viceroy of the king. And the Megillah concludes, obviously, on this high note. As I said, all this, which is a summary of the Megillah, essentially, took around nine years. From the time when King Ahasuerus became king, through the whole process of Haman and the fall of Haman, his, his decree, the fall, the abolishing of the decree, till the end of the Megillah is nine years. So if you live through those nine years, what would you see? You would see uh, events that are very easy to dismiss as random. The king happened to make a party. Then he happened to want to summon his, his, his the Vashti. And then he happened to have her killed. And then a little while later, he happens to search for another queen, and she happens to be Esther. And another period in time, Amerikai happens to overhear the plot against the king's life, take, to take the king's life. And then the, ha- the king happens to have insomnia. Who doesn't have insomnia from time to time? So if you that night, so a king had insomnia. And if, as I said, if you look at it from the, if you were living through it, as any time when you go through something, we see things with, with a myopic vision, you see it only at the moment. Look at your life right now. What happened today, yesterday? Even last year, two years ago, and within time. Most of the events in your life, you will not see patterns that is not because we're necessarily blind or not sensitive, but because when you're on the ground level, it's hard. You can't see the forest from the trees. You see the trees. You see the ground level, and ground level, you only see what happens this moment. There are times in life that you can suddenly see, in retrospect, a certain pattern. But those are very actually great moments when you when you're able to understand your life in that way. It was Kierkegaard that wrote that 
we, we must live our lives frontwards, but we can only understand them backwards. In other words, we live our lives as they unfold, and you don't know the end of the movie until the end. So as, as the frames pass in our lives, each of us, we really don't understand much of it. We may understand pieces of it. This doesn't mean we can't have meaningful experiences and we don't have very rich experiences, but patterns are very, very difficult to see. The story of, the Pur- of Purim and the Megillah had many, many messages. But maybe the, may- maybe the biggest one relevant to us is that it's just the general, the whole framework of the story. Besides the details, the idea of how darkness can become light, which of course is also relevant to our personal lives, and we'll address that as well. But just the basic principle that here's an, here is a story, and when you look at it on the surface level, on the ground level, you really could not tell that anything was happening. No one would have connected Esther becoming queen with one day she would have to be in that position to save the Jewish people. Or the insomnia of, of Achishverosh, as I said. That definitely is a almost trivial thing. But the Megillah is written, and that doesn't take nine years to read it, because it doesn't tell you all the details of all the, the, the tangential and um, so-called... Uh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, parenthetical events that happen, the Megillah talks about the pattern. So it chooses those items that will allow us to understand how all these things were put in the right time in the right place. And the fact is that all our lives are that way, individually, collectively, and also historically. And if you really study any type of, even history, even if it's not a personal issue in our own lives, you look at history, so at the outset, especially if you live through it, you don't always see, in most cases you can't see, these patterns. But when you look in retrospect, patterns emerge everywhere. Now, wise people, or what we call a visionary, a visionary, what makes a visionary a visionary? A visionary is someone who's able to see a vision, who's able to see a pattern before others do, who's able to foresee and, and, have a, have a, and foretell events, not just necessarily out of some type of miraculous prophecy, it's wisdom of being able to not be distracted by the details and being able to see a bigger picture. You see this even in, uh, in, in many areas of thought. You find, for instance, um, certain mathematicians, artists, they'll see a certain pattern and beauty where the rest of us would look at you can't see anything <clears throat> because you don't have the trained eye or you just don't have that genius. Look, there are business people, there are uh, investors, there are others who are able to have a look, that they're able to see patterns where others do not see the patterns. Everyone here in this room has definitely some, in some area of expertise where you can see more than others can see. If it's the area that you have experience in or that you have particular intuition in, I mean, some people do it, I see it in different ways. And for those of us that are not trained, can think of it almost like it's almost like how, how the person know. You almost think the person is being as like a fortune teller. It's not true. It, it comes from, as I said, it's a combination of sometimes it's experience, uh, intuition. Um, often it's a combination of those, plus just a, a, a gift to be able, a keen insight to see things. There are people who have insight in human beings this way, that um, you can tell how a person is going to behave under certain circumstances. Again, this isn't necessarily some type of miracle, miraculous or magical thing. It's just based on a personality, and you understand the human condition. You know, a personality like that, when they're faced with certain challenges, this is usually how they react. It's a common thing, certain things that we all do. And when you hear it from someone who's trained, you almost think, how did that person know I was going to do that? Whether it's the way we go into denial, or the way we avoid situations, or the way we confront situations. Because it's based on seeing a person, we all are made up of, we're all a composite of many, many factors. We have uh, 75 trillion cells, I, I was told recently. Um, I don't know who counted, but it's hard to count that number, but they say 75 trillion cells. And each cell is a whole organism, it's a whole life. So you can imagine that there's a lot of, we're complex creatures. And uh, then we have all the different systems and organs and organisms that m- define who we are. So to look at a human being, even though we may think ourselves as a five, six foot tall, uh, 100, 200, 300 pound individual, hopefully less than that, but I mean, you know, 
just to give the the spectrum, it, it, this this uh, five six foot person happens to have within them many many complexities. So yet, but we all have to have patterns, and patterns don't mean we don't look at all the details. It's just that you're able to look beyond the details and see the general, um, I guess, um, general general direction, general shifts or, or trends of how people behave or how they react to things. This, this doesn't mean we're all predictable or everything is predestined, but usually uh, human nature has its way of reacting to things, and, um, and therefore there is a pattern in that as well. So the story of Purim, as I said, I think one of the maybe most powerful messages is that we have patterns in our own lives. And I think I don't have to elaborate why that's important to know, because above all, if you can actually see patterns, it would give a lot of peace of mind to every one of us because it would make more sense of our lives. The fact is, often we live lives that are like, as I've often discussed in this class, um, victim of circumstances. Or the word victim is too intense for some of us, product of circumstances. That circumstances control our lives. And it does seem often random, um, arbitrary, you know, why certain things happen to certain people, and uh, especially if you're at, the, at the, the suffering end of things, you look at others and you say, why does it happen to me and not to them? Not necessarily you want it to happen to them, but why were you chosen, so to speak? And it's very difficult to take control over life if you see it all as a bunch of random factors. <coughs> if one is able to see patterns, it can help tremendously. As I said, number one is the psychological peace of mind to understand that there's a story unfolding here. It would make things a little more bearable and easier to ride through. So that's what may be one of the most important reasons to know that. But there's something even more important, and that is, what are we supposed to do about it? If someone were able to point out to you a pattern in your life, it also gives you direction, because then you could also say, okay, now, so what's the next chapter? That has not been written yet. And that, it's a whole different attitude if you go into the next chapter of your life, whatever it may be, with a certain approach that the past can inform the future, then you not only take control, you actually help write the next chapter. And you can maybe even change it somewhat. Because then you become part of it instead of being a result of it. So a person like Mordechai, and even Esther, especially Mordechai, because he trained her and he was the mentor and the wise one. So he saw it all. You could see it, the way he tells Esther, for example, when she was in the, play, in the, in the palace. So not, that she, was, it's not so that she was resisting, but when she said she does not sure what to do. So he said to her, why else do you think you were put here? This is a direct quote from the Megillah. So he understood clearly that her being there. And he was the one that had, had he not encouraged her, she would never have gone. Why would she go marry, uh, some say, uh, the biggest fool of the generation? Um, Achishverish. And either way, well, it's not exactly what she... That was not the shidduch she was looking for, I'm sure, in her life. It was only because Mordechai told her that it may seem that this is God's hand, the fact that he's choosing, looking for a new bride, and maybe you'll be in a position... And, and Mordechai at the time had no idea that Haman was plotting what he was plotting. Or maybe he did have an idea, maybe not Haman, but he understood that they were in dangerous times. So Mordechai clearly is a visionary that is able to see, and therefore... It changes the whole dynamic because Esther made choices based on that, that she trusted him. She would never have made that choice to, to make herself available to the king. Or, as he said later to her, why were you put in this place? And then he goes even sharper, he says, that if it doesn't come through you, you think God doesn't have other ways to save the people? In other words, there's a, big, there's a hand behind the curtain, behind the scenes, and uh, a person like a Mordechai is the one who's able to see it and actually defines choices that are made in our lives. So to be able to see the pattern in your own personal life, or at least to even know a semblance of that pattern, can be a tremendous asset, beyond tremendous. It really it can be a major decision that you will make in your life that would be completely different if, if you did not know there was a pattern or a story that's unfolded. So all this is part of the lessons that we take from Purim. And though you can say the same is true with the Passover story or with Hanukkah story or with the Sukkah story, I mean, every holiday 
especially Passover and, Suk- and, and Hanukkah, which are also essentially redemptive stories. In Egypt, the Jews were enslaved, and then they were redeemed, and we celebrate that on Passover the Seder. And Hanukkah was a different form of redemption. So you could say that it's all true there too. Nevertheless, you don't find that the, with, with uh, Passover or with Hanukkah or with other stories where the Jews were saved from particular uh, destruction, quite this type of uh, emphasis on the pattern of it. So no question, I mean, divine providence works all the time. So when the Jews were in Egypt, obviously one thing led to the next. Moses was born. And all. But there, number one, things were very revealed and they were very much more... Um, uh, remember, they were in, in, in Egypt for 210 years. So it wasn't like a lead-up of 210 years where the pieces, you put them together, you connect the dots, and you have a Purim story. There it was much longer and much harder to find these connections. On the other hand, whatever happened was very revealed. Like the ten plagues was not some type of concealed thing. It was very clear. Moses came to Egypt, and there were ten plagues that, uh, that tortured the Egyptians. So there was in general a whole different, the hand of God was very revealed there. You didn't have to dig for a pattern. Which explains also another key thing in Purim, which may be helpful as well in its relevance to our lives. Nowhere in the Megillah do you find the name of God mentioned. Not once. There are words that allude to it. There are words that are acronyms, and the name of God is hidden. But nowhere do you find the name of God. It's the only book in the Torah where God's name is not mentioned. Even though in Song of Songs, some of you who... If you, I don't know if you, that, if you were wondering whether the Song of Songs also does not have the name of God. But as the Talmud says, Shleiman and a few other words are actually names of God. It's just another name for God. In the Megillah, on the other hand, there's nothing that even alludes to God. And the, one of the answers explaining this is because, <coughs> because, this, because that actually captures the story of Purim. The story of Purim is the hand of God is hidden. It's concealed. It's concealed in the patterns. And that really is a demonstration, as the, as the mystics explain it, that there are really t- three types of so-called phenomena. One is a miraculous phenomenon. So Passover was clearly open miracles, things that happened that suspended nature. And no one could doubt that there was something out of the ordinary. Then there is another extreme, pure nature, the sun rises every morning and there are the different cycles of nature, natural cycles that we all experience. And you could dismiss and say this is not necessarily um, uh, defined by any higher power, controlled by any higher power. These are the laws of nature, science. And how do you know you can say that? Because millions of people do say that. So obviously you could say that. And you could uh, give all kinds of arguments that this is set in motion, it's like a clock, and it just works that way. And then there is a third thing, a middle ground, that the, that the mystics, the Kabbalists and Hasidic masters say, it's called a nes melubish beteva. It means a, a, a miracle that's hidden inside of nature. Now this is not to be distinguished, this, this is not to be confused with nature itself. The fact that this world does work like a clock and that it is so symmetrical and such magnificent structure and design is also a testimony, if you think about it, to an architect. Just like no one would ever suggest that a building or a book or a piece of music was built, written or composed on its own, so why would anyone suggest that a world that is so uh, infinitely more complex than any music and any book and any building ever built would not have a, a grand designer. But besides that, that's within nature itself. Besides that, there's a thing called ne- miracles that happen, but they don't happen in a revealed way like in Egypt. They happen masked in the hand of nature. Purim is an example of that. So the fact that, as I said, nature itself, let's say the sun rises and all of that, is the hand of God, yes, but that not necessarily saved anybody. That's just nature as it's working, so there's some force that keeps it going. But then there are miracles that happen that are what we call manifest in nature, where you don't see anything out of the, out of the ordinary. Like the fact that Ma'achashverish married Esther, it's a natural thing, she was beautiful, 
he was looking for a new wife, and she was one of the candidates, and he chose her. You don't have to attribute it to any miracle. There wasn't the suspension of any laws of nature there. It was all within the laws of nature. But if you think about it, why did he, he kill his wife a little while earlier? And of all the people, why did he choose Esther? And then you see the end of the story, it becomes pretty apparent that there was another hand here at work. That just the hand made Achishverosh feel that this is the one he wants to choose. So this is, this is an example of something of a supernatural hand at work, but it's completely manifest in nature. So in our lives as well, and the same is with other things, that insomnia of, of uh, Hashverosh. He couldn't sleep. I'm sure it wasn't the only night he couldn't sleep. And uh, you don't need any miracle for a person not to be able to sleep. People get restless and they can't sleep. But in this case, it happened to be that this sleepless night ended up being that he was going to read the book. He wanted to, they, they, read, they read him the story, and this story aroused his pleasure and wanting to reward Mordechai for what he had done years before. So here too, a completely natural event. Man can't sleep at night. And they read him a story, and the story happens to be one that ends up rewarding Mordechai and setting a whole set of uh, events in motion. So in our own lives, you'll find, you could, look, you could find the th- same three things. There are miracles that happen in people's lives. They may be rare, but they, they happen. Um, as we'll soon discuss, it doesn't mean we should rely on them. It doesn't mean we should even uh, consider that to be the greatest gift. Sometimes a miracle is not always the greatest gift, but they happen. You have t- situations where doctors wrote off someone's life and... And then doctors themselves say a miracle happened. Where it wasn't in any natural way. Then you have the natural cycle of our lives, which is the, the routines we go through every day. And then, and the one we're focusing on here this evening, is the middle one. The miracles that happen in your life, but they don't happen in any, as I said, out of the natural way. They're within nature, but when you connect the dots, it's a pattern that only could have been by another hand, could have really wrote, written that script. And when you find that script, that's when you not only took the lesson of Purim to heart, but you actually can change your life. Um, and on a practical level, what that means is that to suggest that we're all going to suddenly tonight be able to find the patterns, not that easy to do, especially in a group setting, because each of us have our own story. But I would say as an exercise, if you want to begin to look at things that way, even though we are on the ground level and it's hard to see the forest from the trees, my suggestion would be is think of anything in your life that you know for sure that when you met a certain individual, that a certain set in motion, a whole new set of things in your life, where you may still not, the story story may not have ended yet, but it clearly set, it was like a new course that began. It may be meeting a person. It may be traveling somewhere. It may be... Uh, it could be a hundred different things. It may even be a negative thing. It may be you lost a job, and as a result, some new things were that you discovered that at the time you thought was a disaster, and then ends up being it was a blessing in disguise, as they put it. Blessing in disguise, essentially, is taken straight from the Megillah. It's God's is in disguise, which is one of the reasons we wear masks and disguises on Purim, too. Not to conceal it, but to show that it's all a disguise. See, many of us wear masks, and you don't, no one knows you're wearing a mask. On Purim, you know we are wearing a mask, so that already is revelation. That at least we know there's something else behind the scenes. That's one of the reasons um, that we wear masks on Purim. Because God we're, we're, wears a mask, and we're recognizing that this is just a mask, and there's something really behind, behind it all. Right? What do you think about that? So maybe it's time to take off our masks on Purim. Maybe that's what it's about. So if you look at your life, you'll find, as I said, it could be an event, it could be a person, it could be a book even, but it's something that did not remain an isolated event in your life that definitely connected a lot of other things. You find something like that in your life and you begin to find the string of your script. So to go do a whole uh, scripting of your life in this pattern way may not be, be that easy. Because, above all, because you're still there. Remember, we're still, as, uh, we're still living it frontwards. We still don't know what's coming tomorrow and the next day. But 
all of us have memories and you can look back at your life and you'll find things that are definitely fit into the category that I just called something that set in motion other forces. Now, the most difficult place to really to find these patterns, of course, is the area called the, the difficult experiences in life, the pains that we are enduring. You know, why we uh, undergo whatever challenges that we may be undergoing at this point, whether it's the difficulty finding a soulmate, a shidduch, right partner, or finding a job, or just finding peace of mind. There are many, many uh, issues that we struggle with. And while you're in the middle of the struggle, it's obviously going to be extremely difficult to see this as some type of blessing in disguise. And I'm not even suggesting that a person just on faith has to just accept that in that fashion. Because it's not so easy just to tell somebody, listen, don't worry, you're suffering, but it's all part of a big picture. I don't know if it helps that much when a person is in that state. So my suggestion would be rather to go a different other way around. Find things in your life that you could acknowledge and it's easier for you to identify as being somewhat of a, um, uh, a defining moment, maybe is the right word, or some type of juncture. Like in this case with Purim, if you think about it, I mean, there's like maybe ten events that are the key. The killing of Vashti, the finding of Esther, the, insomnia, the night of insomnia, the... Um, uh, Mordechai overhearing the, the plot. You know, these elements. So, if, you, if, if someone was wise and looking at these events, you'd, you'd look, one of them, you'd, you'd pick up on one of them, and once you pick up on it, you know, once you have a string, it's easier to follow. It's easier to follow a script. Now, of course, it's always, above all, it's easiest when you do this with someone who's trained and can help. But I think as a uh, so-called Purim exercise, um, if we did a full workshop, a Purim workshop, it would really be is looking at your life that way. That uh, maybe another way to do it is think of yourself as a a uh, screenwriter, and the, 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 and, the, and the and the play and the play or the film you're writing is your own. I know that's not so easy to do, but if you look at it from, from the outside, if someone else was looking at your life from the outside, then they'd see it where you are right now. So there's events that happen to you. And uh, including, obviously, your formative years as a child in your parents' home. And then events that subsequent to that. And then there are going to be some major events, whatever they are. Uh, hopefully they're good ones. Sometimes they're not such good ones. You know, there's major, major highlights. I know it may sound simplistic, but you'd be surprised if you sat down with a piece of paper and you really wrote down the highlights of your life as if like because because you live with them so you feel that it's so obvious to you but if you write them down and look at them like an outsider would you'll be pride, you'll be I, I guarantee you, you'll be a little surprised at what you'll see not because you'll see something new like a new event that you didn't think of it just you'll be able to look at things more in a context of structure you know this happened that happened and I have no doubt if you do that you will find in a few places some patterns. It may just be pieces right now, not the full pattern, but the pieces of it. And that's how one begins, to see the hand of God. There's no question about it. I mean, I don't, I, I look at my own life, I'm even thinking, if I would do this exercise, you know, there's a few major events in my life. Obviously, certain mentors I met, certain books I read, uh, especially when in those formative years when you are exploring teenage years. And of course, in my case, it would also include my father's passing, um, and death so it's not always a positive thing we're talking about and these defining moments if you think about them and what they set in motion there's no doubt that they, they, they help you def see yourself in a different uh, context so this is a uh, we talk about always personalizing uh, Judaism you know it's one thing Purim is a nice holiday I'm sure everyone will have a good time you go to friends, meals, parties and uh, gifts. For some people, actually, holidays are not such a pleasant experiences because if you don't have a good family that you're comfortable with, a healthy family, holidays can be somewhat of more than a drag. It can be actually a, a very sore spot. I know that as well, so I wanted to acknowledge that. But regardless, the, the above all, what really is demanded of us, which I always discuss here in this class, is the idea of personalizing. It. How do you turn it into something that's your... Uh, relevant to you spiritually and psychologically. So the story of Purim, as I mentioned, has many lessons. But 
when you're able to define it and see the whole story as your own story. In this case, really looking at your own uh, situation and looking and understanding that there are patterns, you will uh, experience Purim in a completely different way. So when you hear the Megillah tomorrow night, and uh, Purim you hear it twice on, sh- on Friday as well, a second time in the morning. And uh, as I said there are many details of the story, but above all, think about the pattern things. And of course, the patterns of Purim themselves, specifically, cover really the whole gamut, the whole spectrum of life, the ups and downs. You know, King Achishverosh Ach- Ach- is king, makes a party. So that's a high point. Then there's a killing. There's a dull point. So the soap opera on all levels. And then a, uh, the search for a new bride. So another uh, simcha. And then the down point, Haman's decree. And the up of the victory. So Purim has in itself extremes. And as I mentioned before, it also deals with darkness and light and transformation. And that's what I, wa- I wanted to add about transformation was transformation is very much the story of patterns. When a person does not see a pattern in their lives, it's very difficult to transform anything because you disconnect. It's like disconnected dots. Transformation is only possible when you see an experience in your life and they say, you know, why did it happen to me? So at the time, it could be very painful and difficult. But ultimate redemption is achieved is when you're able to take the experience that you had and, uh, and um, strip it of its uh, grief. And what you're left with is the energy of whatever you learn from it. And this is the key secret to everyone, every healing. Every form of healing needs to do that. When you talk about psychological healing... So it's one thing if you're able to move on and ignore a, a, a difficult, a traumatic experience. By all means, if a person is able to do that, if it's just like a headache. If you can take a painkiller or, or a Band-Aid and it solves the problem, obviously you don't have to dig deeper. But when you deal with deeper issues, psychological issues, we all know it's not so simple. You can't just uh, get rid of the symptoms because they keep popping up in one place or another. So ultimate, the ultimate goal is to reach into the core, into the root of the issue, not just the symptom, the root, and learn to rechannel it. Because you're not going to just eliminate it by ignoring it. It's about rechanneling it. And rechanneling is a different word for tra- transformation. And it's about a pattern. And this is true for all of us in our lives. I'll just give you an example for uh, just an example that comes to mind. It may or may not be relevant to anyone here. But it's just an example. You could apply it to any given situation. I remember, uh, when was it, in the 2000, 2001, I was uh, hosting a radio show in New York. It was a live show every Sunday from 6 to 7 p.m. And the only reason actually that it stopped, it was, it was quite, quite successful. It was live with call-ins, which every week the phone, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. You remember that? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. By the way, all the transcripts of these shows are on the, our website, MeaningfulLife.com. The transcripts. We'll put on the audio as well. But uh, right now the transcripts are there. And I chose specially topics, which I really ask people, topics that no one really talks about. Like, uh, I think uh, Thanksgiving time, I did one that I mentioned, I alluded to earlier, um, uh, you know, like celebrating the holiday. What, what, what do you do when home doesn't feel like home? That was it. And the idea actually came to me from someone who obviously had that feeling during the holiday season. And we did one on um, how do you honor parents who don't deserve honor, who don't seem to deserve honor, let's put it that way. So you can imagine pretty hot topics, a lot of call-ins, uh, people venting. And one of the later last shows, I forgot which one, I think it was the last show, or well, next to last show, I, or, the, or the reason, by the way, the show didn't continue was because ESPN bought WVD, which was the station I was on, and I was not willing to do sports radio. <laughs> so, um, so, but now we're almost there with webcast, so we have a type of uh, live. We'll, we'll, we'll get ESPN after all. I remember actually one, one Sunday night was the Super Bowl, and I was on from 6 to 7. Now the Super Bowl begins like 6.22 or something, right? First kickoff or something. And uh, so 
Uh, I think that year there was a little a lower ratings for the Super Bowl because of my radio show. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody heard it, but I definitely... 10%? Is it 10%? No, knows? I offered, the, I offered they could have bought me out if they wanted, let's put it this way. So I wouldn't compete with them the next year. Um, but the show, one of the later shows was uh, titled, and it was a topic that actually came to me because many people asked me this question, including in this class. And the, topic, the title was, um, How to Grow Out of... Uh, I don't know. It's online, I don't remember the exact title. But something growing, th- growing through. It's all right. Sorry, right. Gro- growing through our pasts, or something like that. Growing through our past. I'll explain it. You'll understand what I was addressing. And it was basically about um, how do you d- how do you deal with the past of your life, which is already past, which means you can't control it any longer. So it, this includes, of course, experiences that you may deeply regret. Things you made real mistakes. Whether it was malicious, not malicious, almost irrelevant after the fact. Maybe it's not irrelevant, I should qualify that. But regardless, it's after the fact. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with experiences that were truly negative experiences? As I said, if it's malicious, it's one thing. Even if it's not, still it happened. And it was out of ignorance, but it caused damage to you, to others. So, um, examples of this can be in relationships. It can be personal behavior. It can be things that, choices you made, how you uh, reacted to things, uh, you know, the list goes on. So I remember, that, I don't remember how we got to, that, to, to this example, but I think I shared the story that happened once in this class years ago. At the end of the class, a guy came in close to the, uh, close to 10 o'clock, and a fellow f- drops into the, we were then on 80, uh, 81st Street or 89th Street, one of the two. And he's clearly high on something. It's like because he was uh, very, he uh, was uh, uninhibited, let's put it that way. Um, unnaturally uninhibited. So, um, but I knew him because he had come to the class before, but he, he happened to call, come in a little late, and as I said, a little louder than usual. And there were a point of question. So he says, let me ask you a question, something like that. And the question was, um, you know, I grew up in a pretty or traditional observant home, and this, he's, he's telling the story. And then at the age, uh, when I was a teenager after bar mitzvah, and then as I grew, I just dropped it all. I stopped. He had to, he was putting on tefillin every day. He stopped putting on tefillin. Stopped keeping Shabbos kosher. He said, "Let me tell you, Rabbi, what brought me back to my Judaism. It was LSD." <laughs> LSD. You know what that is? <coughs> really? How do you know it? Well, I, I know of it. I've never used it. <laughs> Can you prove that? <laughs> you didn't inhale? <laughs> inhale. <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> what they do in your days, uh, the teenagers? Teenagers? Uh, yeah. Rock and roll. Rock and roll, and the most it was a little smoking, regular like cigarettes. That's it. No drugs. Biggest vice. No, no, no noticeable drugs. Okay. They didn't do that. Yep. Times have changed. They certainly have. You know the you know the, the joke they tell about this uh, guy that he's talking this old Jew. And he's talking about elderly Jew. And they're talking about musicians. Someone says, Mozart. She says, oh, Mozart, yeah, yeah, he lived on my block. <laughs> in the Lower East Side. I said, Mozart, Mozart died, uh, died. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember it was a big funeral, right? Yeah. <laughs> so they, they said, no, but he died a few hundred years ago. So he says, oi, the sight left. Oi, how time flies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, <laughs> so back so okay so this guy is go- going on about LSD what was the story he's telling us he left so he basically it was a common story 
I mean, I know this fellow. I still see him around. He was like uh, very typical to a lot of people who were coming at the cla- to the class at the time. Do you remember? These are uh, musical, mu- musical '60s types. That that uh, Zen Buddhism, LSD, and this stuff, as opposed to so-called traditional uh, methods. So, so he <laughs> said that he went to LA. He ended up in LA, and that's when he discovered the acid, and. Uh, and that's how he discovered God, much the real God, not the God from the yeshiva, and that was uh, but a true open God. He was once on a plane flying back from west coast to the east coast, and he says he, whenever he went on a plane, this is he's telling the story at the end of the class. Whenever he went on a plane, he would always uh, drop some acid. It was always very nice up there in the clouds. He described it in detail. The clouds vibrate the colors, the whole scene. And then suddenly he hears from the back of the plane there was a minion going on. Some people were davening. There was a minion. So he hears him saying Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish which is what we say in the middle of the Shem Nesra. And suddenly he said in his visions he saw the celestial angels. Suddenly he saw a whole picture of them. So he jumped up, he went to the back of the plane and he put on tefillin for the first time in 20 years he davened with them and he says and that slowly brought me back to my uh, Judaism so he's, now he's saying so what do you say about that what do you think about that and I thought it was a good question because on one hand this is what brought him to a certain awareness on the other hand what, you know, what am I supposed to say exactly so I said look uh, I mean after the initial joke I said uh uh, you'd have to go to OU or OK Labs or something to uh, get a hechsher. What do you want from me? You want to have as a endorsement for LSD, kosher? Like glatt kosher LSD or what? Um, but his point was a good one. So I answered, my answer was, and this, I, I shared this on the radio briefly. I said, was that, um, it's about growing through our past, and back to the story of Purim, that imagine somebody falls into a coma, God forbid. And anything they try, the doctors, they can't get the person out of the coma. They're like, at some point, you know, they, uh, they, they, they're, gonna, they're desperate because the person goes into a state of uh, vegetation for too long, atrophy and so on. That uh, is, is very... So for someone, one doctor says, you know what, why don't we maybe try a massive dose of drugs to just shake up his whole system. It's a hypothetical scenario which you would never, never administer to anybody that was healthy, because it can kill them. But here in this circumstance, you do whatever it takes to, to, to shake a person up. And they do it, and he's revived. So I said, what would you say to that? You say, this is what everybody should be doing, whoever is in the spiritual coma. I said, I think we live in a generation where many people are in a spiritual coma, not necessarily due to their fault. You grow up in bankrupt schools, a religion that is irrelevant, and taught in ways that don't talk to the soul. So it's not a surprise that 60% of Buddhists in America are Jewish. This is a true statistic. Because they're seekers, and if you don't get it in your own backyard, you're going to look elsewhere. So I'm no, I'm, So we live in a time where there's a deep spiritual coma going on. And maybe God, in his mysterious ways, has did plant reminders of himself in India, and in Eastern mysticism, and in LSD too. I don't have a problem saying that. Just like these massive drugs could save a person who's in a coma, so there's something in them. No one's denying the fact, but you would never ever suggest it to a healthy person. So I said, that's my answer to you. My answer to you is, if that's what brought you there, you have to, there's, there was something there that maybe God led you in a strange path because you had no other way to get there, and this is the path that, you, that led you to God. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to invalidate that. That doesn't mean, however, you validate the LSD. You just validate the result that brought you there. And now at this point, what I told this fellow, I said, at this point, you don't, need, we don't, you don't have to rely on those massive drugs. There is, a, there is a time-tested path that was used by Moses and by Abraham and others to find God in a very profound way that, can, that is just as powerful as any, um, any, uh, any type of foreign uh, or induced state of, myst- of, uh, of psychedelic experience. You know, so uh, that was my general response. I'll just tell you what happened. The radio show was actually very funny what happened next. 
I started getting calls. The phone didn't start, I'll get off the hook. Why am I criticizing drugs? I thought I was going to get calls for even saying that there's some <laughs> redeeming factor in it. All the calls were the other way around. How could you reject me talking about this as a spiritual and all that? And then one person finally calls, you sound so open-minded. Did you ever try it yourself? <laughs> that you can so easily dismiss it? They all wanted, like, everybody was uh, supportive. Now, it's true I didn't try it either. You and I, the only two people maybe in this room. Um, I don't mean that in any way. Uh, uh, but, because we're the two oldest people in this room, that's why. No, you're not. No? No? Okay. I thought so. with my children's generation. Right. Anyway, but I, I, what happened, all these calls came in. Now, thank God, who was in the studio that, that Sunday? Good, our, good, our good friend who may be online, Philip Namenworth. And Philip, I knew, well, based on what he shared with me, that he has some things to say about this. So I said to Philip, why don't you come over? It's live radio. So it was like exciting. Philip, please come in here. He was in the other room taking calls. So he comes, he was the engine, with the engineer there. He comes into the room, I put him on, and he gets on. And first of all, he listed his 75 different type of mushrooms that he tried, just mushrooms. <laughs> I mean, he had like, I didn't know there were so many variations. Um, wow. And I don't know if it's 75. It's a little exaggeration. You get that, you get that idea. So, but then he basically, first of all, he established his credentials, <laughs> that he, his resume, that he can speak about in this topic. Okay. So that was that. And then he shared, it was very interesting what he said. He said very simply, he said that he, he says there's no question that he probably would not have uh, ultimately reached Jewish spirituality had he not gone through that journey because it did open up the states of consciousness but he said 90% of his friends either, either overdosed or were burned out to the point they can never live their lives normally uh, he says those that didn't live their lives normally not because they stayed there because they learned to, to grow through it I mean, it was interesting what he said, because then he spoke from experience, and he wasn't speaking from a religious point of view, he was speaking from a human point of view. The reason I'm saying all of this is just really to go back to the theme, is that I think it's a vital, vital point, and it's a tremendous point that you can learn from Purim as well in the whole pattern discussion and transformation. You see, you find rabbis, for example, that... Uh, that you say to them, LSD, they'll say, oh, you got, you got in the Himmel, you got the Vey, how could you say such so? thing? And they, don't, they won't even, you know, they'll just look at it as complete evil. They can't even talk about it. Then there are others who say, hey, there's a lot of, uh, all the roads lead to Rome, so there's a mitzvah, there's the LSD, there's this. You know, Rome. Not all to Jerusalem. And there's a middle path. You don't have to invalidate a person's past experiences just because there's another, because let's say the Torah straightway would have been differently. On the other hand, you don't have to continue to condone the, a past experience just because it's helped you grow somewhere. I look at it that you have to be a little wise and it's a little more complicated. It's not so black and white. A person may have done something wrong in the past and you still can redeem it. What do you redeem? It doesn't mean you continue doing the wrong thing. You, take, you, you, um, you extract from the wrong experience the spark of goodness that brings you to a better place. And this is not my own concept. This is pure, straight from Torah. This is what true tshuva is, by the way. When you say tshuva, people mistake. They think tshuva means you did a sin, and now you're not doing a sin anymore. That's not tshuva. Tshuva means return. Tshuva is transform transformative. What it means is that you take an experience that you learned from that's unique to you. It could have been a, a mistake you made. It could be a grave mistake. But there's something that, that, you, that you, once you were there already, there's some wisdom, there's some experience, there's something that you have after the fact that, that can be redeemed and the Talmud puts it in very very actually graphic terms it talks about a prostitute a prostitute and the expression the Talmud uses is that the pillows that she would offer in sin she ended up offering in mitzvah and the Talmud uses that expression specifically the same pillows which means then obviously she changes her ways and she becomes a, a, a wife of a great Talmudic scholar. But it wasn't just that she ignored her past and, did, and forgot about it. She actually, the same pillows. Now, what that means you can discuss in many different levels. The bottom line it means is 
that we don't have to amputate our past completely, which in general is not even possible, and that never healthy. What you have to learn to do is distinguish between the, uh, a negative act and the so-called energy that was in, within it, or the passion within it, and that can always be channeled. I'll just use another example. I did this, um, I think I did a, a two-part class here. We're, making, we're turning it into a CD now. It was called Anatomy of Lust and Desire. How does that sound? Wait. Good. <laughs> so he says there in, uh, he says, sorry, sorry, I discussed at length there, it says in the Kutta Teira, which is Hasidic test, a very fascinating concept. He talks about desire and passion. So you'll find some people, they hear the word desire and passion, that alone is already going to could cause a heart attack to some uh, religious authorities. As if desire and passion is a bad thing. Whereas desire and passion are not. So there's desire and passion. Now can desire and passion lead to bad things? Of course. There are sins of... There are, there, are, there are desires and passions that lead people to the worst destructive behavior. Whether it's addictions, whether it's sexual, whether it's drugs, whether it's gambling, whether it's other highs that people need some type of moment of, of passion or desire that leads them to a place that can be extremely destructive. It can be irreversibly destructive even. So he makes a distinction there in, the, in, that, in that text that I'm referring to. Very interesting distinction. The distinction is, he says there's a difference between an object of desire and the desire itself. So for instance, um, a child desires to play with a toy. An adult desires to read a book. And another, and a tzaddik desires to help another person. I'm just, is there a distinction between these three desires? No, the, the desire itself, the power of desire is, is the same. The difference is the object. For a child, a child's immature mind, what is desirable, what is, makes him happy? A little thing that is trivial to us, it mean, be meaningless to an adult. A child is not, is not, does not have a desire or pleasure in reading a book or intellectual stimulation. Some of us have desire in doing a good thing for another. Some of us have not matured to that point. So in other words, to say that a tzaddik, for example, has a less passionate life or a less enjoyable life because they're not indulging in their own selfish needs is a big mistake. Their passion and desire happens to be from very noble and very loftier experiences. Like some people have passion in spirituality and others have it in very uh, instant gratification. So the point that he makes there is that what we're looking to do is not to change the desire in a person, the power to desire, or the ability to be passionate about something. What we look to do is to mature, a person should come to uh, broaden their horizons, that the objects they choose should be a little more mature. But not that they're compromising and someone saying, you know what, now at this point in your game, you were, at this point in your life, you were very passionate. Now you have to go to a new level and become more uh, so-called uh, observant and religious. No more passion, now you have to be sacrifice yourself for a higher cause. That's often how it's presented. And as you'll say, is that what you get in return is greater. So it's worth the sacrifice. That's not, uh, that's not Jewish thinking at all. Jewish thought, there, there may be, listen, there's always a stage where we may have to sacrifice something. But in Jewish thought, what, re, what you're really saying is that transformation, not sacrifice, that you, you become more passionate, as a matter of fact, when your, desi- when your objects are also more, uh, more powerful. So the, channel, the challenge is not whether you're going to have a passionate life or not, a passionate life or a life of service to God. It's just a question whether you're going to have a passionate life driven by passions and desires that are so-called superficial or uh, instant or immediate or uh, destructive, or they're going to be driven by passions and desires that have uh, eternal power and meaning. That's why in the context, let's say, of sexuality, there's no sense from a Jewish perspective as opposed to a Christian one, sexuality is not some necessary evil. Evil. It's considered to be the most intimate, most divine experience a human being can have. Can it be used in destructive ways? Yes. Can it be the uh, a cause of much darkness in people's lives? Yes, it's one of the darkest places for some people. But it's also the lightest places. So it's not about the, the sexuality itself, it's about the object, it's how you channel it, so to speak. So in the context of transformation, let's say we're talking here about, I mentioned drugs before. I mean, I'm just using these examples. 
let's say you go back to the initial, going back to the initial question, you did something that your past, something in your past you don't like, you're ashamed of, a mistake, a big mistake. So one thing, to, one way is to just ignore it, and uh, as if it never happened, or which I would say usually will not work. You may ignore it, you may never talk about it again, but to say that it doesn't affect you is, is usually not the case. I'm talking about something obviously that's a, a big, not a small matter that you could just move on. So the ultimate challenge is, and this is what it says in the Megillah V'napachum, transformation. It wasn't enough just to thwart and to eliminate Haman's plot um, an other but to turn the month into a month of joy. Whereas, had Haman not come around, other would have never become a month of joy. Now we have a whole month of joy, not just one day. Obviously, Purim is the high point, but the whole month of joy, only because there was a Haman that wanted to kill all the Jews this month. And that's what remains with us today. We remember what he wanted to do, but what remains with us is joy. And not regular joy. It's more joys than the month before and the month and the other month and all months of the year. That's the ultimate example where a spark was redeemed. So the Torah says clearly to go in and say I'm going to sin or do something really bad in order to redeem it because there's some very powerful spark in it. That's not acceptable. But once something has happened, after the fact, like I said with the pillows before, there is redemption. Now, this is obviously a complicated subject and difficult to speak in general terms, but it really means is that whatever it is that you went through in your life, if you use wisdom and maybe someone that helps you objectively look at it, you'll see there's something you came out that you have that's unique that you can use to better yourself and others as well. And really unique and powerful. I've seen it personally in the place, the hardest, the place maybe the hardest place to find it, people who have suffered very serious abuse as children. And I've seen, some are still struggling, I mean, everyone continues to struggle, but some still have not redeemed it yet, let's put it this way. And I've seen those that have, I, I don't, from the most refined people that I know, are people who suffered the most. How is that possible? You'd think, okay, maybe they're not bitter any longer, they're not angry. Maybe they neutralized it. But I've actually seen this, and I, I can testify it, I've seen it more than once an unbelievable level of refinement, a whole different qualitative level of refinement that comes with people who've gone through the fire. And I've, the only one way I understand it is in this context. Because though the experience, I don't envy them and I don't wish it on them and, I, and God forbid I'm not justifying it, but after the fact, the, the, that experience when it's redeemed has some power that's unique, that they're able to help others and help themselves in ways that are unbelievable. I know one particularly one person who has a few children, and I would say these children are from the best children I've ever met. And this is a parent who had to bring up the children herself, uh, had an unbelievably abusive childhood. And some people say, well, usually abusive people repeat it in their lives and their children, mm -hmm. and here is the exact opposite. She, she had the strength and the wisdom and the sensitivity to basically do everything opposite of what she was done to her. How she figured that, I guess she figured out from the opposite. Whatever her parents did, she made sure not to do. So that's also, I guess, a way to come to, the, to light. Now, is this person uh, healed, so to speak? I would hardly say that, but I see the results. You can't deny the results. Children who are married, they're happy, and as I said, they're extraordinary. They're not ordinary. Is it all due to that fact? A big part of it, I have no doubt. It's not just genes. Because she paid a very heavy price, and she did transform her life. And it's not the only time. I'm sure if you th look at it, you, could, you can find examples of this. Again, I just want to qualify. This does not mean, it's not a justification. This isn't answering the question why God would do this to some people. I don't, that, those are the mysteries I don't have answers for. I'm talking about after the fact. And this has a lot to go back to the issue of the patterns. This has a lot to do with patterns. People who learn to transform are people who see patterns. They have the humility to not continue to um, bitch about the past, pardon the expression, but there are people, you know, they just continue to dwell. Because I, I, I could tell you, I counsel some people, and there's a few people who keep telling me, and I know them for years, they just keep, 
they can't get over how life, how their life is unfair to them. And I understand. I'm not suggesting that they shouldn't uh, have that complaint, but they're haunted by it, and that paralyzes them. That's what bothers me. It's not that they aren't entitled to say why life was not fair to them, but that haunts them to the point they cannot grow. They can't grow out of their anger and resentment of, of, of a very difficult past. And this is true also whether it's the shame we carry from past experiences or the, the regrets. The key here is not the, the, not the fact that experience can be complete, one that should be, that, that maybe deserves to be such, uh, such pain, such regrets and so on. But if you're trapped simply by that, and that becomes the dominant feeling that that's a terrible thing that happened, you will never be able to redeem it. And that's why, there's an interesting Torah, I never saw it inside, I'm looking for it. The Baal Shem Tov says that Rishayim, wicked people, are filled with regrets. Okay, that, now he, well, he doesn't say that, that says in the Talmud. But he explains why. He says because they don't believe in divine providence. What does that mean? That their, their, their regret, regret may be a good, you could, may, you could say that's great to have regrets. You did something wrong, you have regrets. I know some people do something wrong, they don't have regrets. So what's wrong with having regrets? No, but it goes deeper than that. They have regrets and that's all they have. They never redeem it. It's, they dwell in the regret. It's almost like they, ju- they, they almost, re- they almost like, um, cleanse themselves and just, I regret, I regret. What do you want me to do? Divine Providence states that once it happened, you're now in a position that's unique, that you can do something different than anyone else can do. That's why it's wicked people who have regret. They dwell in the regret and they do not dwell on building a better future. What are you doing tomorrow with it? And this is true across the board. I mean, on a simple level, they say, when a man with money meets a man with experience, so the man with experience ends up with the money, and the man with the money ends up with the experience. (laughs) So there you go. That's also redemption. You know, first you didn't have the experience, and now hopefully you you don't do it again. Now you have the experience. This is true. This is, as I said, on a very simple level. And I think that's another second message of Purim, which is really a subset of the patterns. Because when you look at patterns themselves, it's easy to see patterns, obviously, when things are going well. You know, you get a good job. It leads you to other opportunities. And other opportunities, you meet good people, blah, blah. I'm not suggesting that isn't part of the Purim story, too. But where it's more complicated to see patterns, obviously, is when it didn't go well. That's the whole challenge. That's the story of Purim. Things didn't go well all the time. And there, there's also a pattern. Because that's when, that's when you really have the challenge to, to look at those things. So I go back to what I said initially. A, good, a suggestion I would make is that to look at your life and try to define some of those milestones. Like a Purim type of model. You know, when was your Achishverish moment? When was the Vashti moment? <laughs> the Esther moment? I don't know if you could exactly find all those. I'd have to think it through. Whether, But I'm sure we all have uh, our ups and downs. But regardless, it's about looking at those things and trying to um, creating a string, a string theory, a string um, connection from those few moments that are like defining, and that begins to define patterns. And the second thing what I was saying was about transformation, as recogni- recognizing that we all have pasts, and we all have pasts of some things we'd rather not look at, some things we d- that didn't work out, but if you remember you're here right now and your life is not over, thank God. And there are many more chapters to come. And uh, it's, it's both, I think, an act of humility and an act of, of health to recognize that even though something may not have worked a certain way, there are ways to redeem it. There are ways to transform it. There are ways to channel it. No, absolutely. And, and if, if, you, if you need examples, one maybe example in anything is... If you can teach someone who's been the path that you've been, you teach them what you've learned. You've been, you're a little further down the road. I always find that it's a very... I always find it very gratifying to refer people who I know are going through certain challenges to <coughs> others that I know that have had similar challenges. Obviously, maintaining confidentiality. Because I find it to be really redeeming for a person who's been there. Like if you've been on that road five years ago, two years ago, one year ago, you meet someone... Not exactly, but more or less, the lessons you can teach them are tremendous. Obviously, this is all predicated on the willingness to listen. Because part of the big problem is that we don't know how to listen at times. 
and that uh, the people who have the best things to say to us were not ready to hear them. But you know that obviously is something which we have to make a choice about. But if but but considering that that is that that's in place, the best the best lessons you learn from people who um, who've been there. I think that um, you know experience experience is under obviously under appreciated. You'll find many things we all do that uh, if it was a business or something else, you definitely would go to an expert or someone who's done it before you to ask them. When it comes to personal emotional things, we rarely do that. We rarely go to someone that has been there. Whether it's because we're ashamed to talk about it or because we think we can figure it out or we minimize the challenge. I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter. It's, it comes down to blind spots. So here we have a story of Purim. It's a story of darkness, a story of light. It's a story of patterns. And it really teaches us, above all, as I said, to look at our lives in a new way. To look at the fact that there are forces at work that are even miracles, that are disguised. You may not see it at this point, and that's the challenge, is how to uh, expose it, to uncover it. Now, if you need help, and you can't do it yourself, I'm ha- more than happy to try to help you if I can. Um, I have Belleville here. <laughs> who can also do a little help, right? Um, and I, but I really think we could all help each other because uh, I'm sure I have things in my life that I could use your help because when, you, when, you, when you're subjective and you're on your own way of looking at it, you don't always see it. And I was sitting yesterday in an area in, in the Shalim called Ben Yehuda. This is a it's the square. And I was just uh, sitting at the table with a laptop and... Uh, you see I'm whizzing by uh, Jews of all backgrounds, literally. And as I said, the Purim spirit is right in the air, so it's, 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 it's uh, somewhat rocking. And I can't, probably thousands of people while I was sitting there came by. Uh, walk by, that is. And quite a few, Jerusalem has this strange thing, you meet people you never meet anywhere, but you, you meet them there. There's certain corners, there's a few places you go, suddenly you meet people you haven't seen. If you remember... I haven't seen Jeff in a long time. I was in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv and suddenly Andrews. meet him. Right? And, right. So I don't know what it is, but why I'm mentioning it is because when I was looking and I was thinking about this whole patterns, um, you put yourself in certain situations and you suddenly see them emerge. I think a lot of times, many times, why we don't see patterns is because we um, go into, uh, no pun intended, our own unhealthy pattern which means we get locked in our own way of doing things. So maybe next time you go to work or you go to lunch, take a different street, you know, do something a little different, and you'll see it's easier to recognize new patterns that way. Because sometimes our routines are like really traps. They're like we hide behind them, and they don't let you get see anything else. So that becomes the, the block. So sometimes to do it in a different way, which maybe just to give you a little Purim Torah, is why Esther had two meals. You know, why couldn't she just ask all she needed for the, at the first uh, festive meal? So usually you explain it because she wanted to warm them up. You know, the first meal, she tells Achashverosh, I want something, and he says, what do you want? So she, like, uh, so she wanted to whet his appetite, that, uh, so to speak. Um, but the fact is, maybe it's also because you have to always do things a little differently a second time, and new things open up. So I make another, another suge- Purim suggestion is that uh, something that we need to get out of our little regular routines, and that may include traveling to a new place, going to a new synagogue to hear the Megillah, <laughs> or uh, hosting something at your Shabbos table, maybe something you aren't used to doing. Those things tend to open up uh, our eyes to see uh, some of the dots, connecting the dots that are there already in place. Okay. You tired? <laughs> okay. You know what happens Something usually. <laughs> That's what they all say. Yeah. I understand. I understand. That's another discussion we have to have: is why when one person yawns, other people yawn. Right? Just one of the folk. Um, what are they called? Whatever. Anyway. Um, that's not relevant to the webcast people. 
It is. It is. If you yawn, they will yawn out there. <laughs> I think I just saw someone yawning on the, on, on the internet right now, actually. I feel it. What so, uh, happens sometimes when you are at the spiritual lecture and suddenly you feel that you are falling asleep? Because the speaker is just being boring. No, 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 no. Just at the contrary. Just oh. at the contrary, you see. That's why. Right. Sometimes it's not true. I've been wondering that for 25 years, that question. But <laughs> uh, I always made a rule for myself when I speak, not to say by this class, but when I go speak Friday night, Shabbos, you know, travel, that I speak until I see the first yawn. Um, and then, of course, some people start yawning right away. So, No, no, I'm, I'm just being a little humorous. Yeah. Poor in spirit. I, I, do you feel yourself in that place once in a while? I felt a few times. Yeah, sure. me, but the other people just a few minutes. It could be maybe. Look, you know, I, I see it this way. Uh, the soul hears everything that's being said. Mm. Sometimes your body is in the way. Mm-hmm. So you have to put your body to sleep so the soul can hear. Someone explained that you are getting too much light suddenly and your vessel is not ready to... Uh, you're, uh, something like this. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Okay, so everybody, have a very, very happy Purim. Have you seen any changes since the last time you visited Israel? Yeah, the what food is a lot better. better. <laughs> <laughs> what was Spiritual changes, you mean? No, any. Because they are changing everything so fast. What I have, I, I have very many, 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 very many f- mixed feelings when I go to uh, the Holy Land, if I may say so, uh, because on one hand, I, it's a big paradox, that country for me, I guess for everybody, because on one hand, it's a very holy place, and you feel it. On the other hand, there's, um, there's a certain complacency that is very disturbing, you know, <coughs> The Western Wall, of course, is a powerful place. And it's a remnant of the wall of a destroyed temple. But today you have people who you know, pay more money to have a window. You can see the Western Wall and eat a little pizza yeah. or sushi. So sometimes you wonder whether uh, this uh, like has become part of uh, a certain comfort zone, the whole scene. And it's difficult to maintain a spiritual sensitivity when you get used to it. So there's a certain part of it that's very, that uh, that's disturbing. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. I guess it would be very hard for me to live there just for that reason alone. Because I wouldn't want to get into that. Here, you're in dark in the first place. The whole place is a, a world of darkness. There, it's, So it's not dark, it's light. It's, it's just, I'm not, uh, as I said, it's not meant to be negative in any way. It's uh, the paradox of Golos. On one hand, Golos means that the divine presence is concealed. On the other hand, we are living in comfortable times. So that they have now a new thing. I think it opened in August. When you go to the Jaffa Gate, into the old city. So uh, you have now a big mall. So you have all the brand names of any type of shopping you can do. And then you can go right into the Jaffa Gate and go straight to the wall. So in case you get a little guilty. Um, and at great restaurants there, and I was guilty of eating in one of them myself. So, so these are some of the paradoxes on one end. Israel is one big crazy place, you know. It's a, it's a sugar place in many ways. Uh, I was driving; a cab driver was driving me the other day, and uh, I asked him to take me to a certain street. It's uh, in Gaula, and he's there for sixty years. He says he doesn't; he never heard that street before. He says it must be a street that you can't even drive into. You actually could drive into it. But he wasn't surprised because also in Jerusalem you always find new streets. There's always another street. Remember the streets, you can go on one street and suddenly it changes the name because, you know, then there's another twist and turn, another street. The whole. Anyway, so, I, so he said to me, and you know, he lived there for 60 years. So I asked him, what's the best for your favorite street to drive on? So he told me, then go all of this street, you go up, or, um, what is it, Malach, uh, Malach Yisrael, that street, with buses, cabs, people. No, everyone's oblivious of each other. Everybody's moving around. <laughs> the only thing missing is a donkey and a camel, a few donkeys and camels, and then it would really be perfect scene. And it's just an interesting block, you know, street, street there. Uh, everything, everything combines there. Everything. It's like you never think anything's going to move because you just sit. 
you know, in New York, it would be either cars or people. There, it's like all one big mix. And he loves to drive. There. I asked him, Purim, what is he going to do? He said he's going to drive on this block just to see what's going on, and then he's going to celebrate the rest of the day. Is that right, Malchus? So there's a, a very interesting phenomenon there. We have here a Jerusalemite from, from birth, a, a, a original specimen. Can we hang? Yes. What were we saying with Velvel? It's, it's a very weird, weird place, Israel. Very crazy, in a good way. Mixed up. On one hand, there's no leadership. On the other hand, the country is thriving. I can't figure that out. You know, the economy is booming, technology. Yes. On the other hand, the leadership is as corrupt as it gets. No one is interested. Yeah. So it's a very, it's all paradoxical. It's like, they're like, people don't have money, but they have pockets. They say they go all the way till, till the center of the earth, you know, and they come out with euros and dollars and, and shekels. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's everything opposite of the United States, I could say that. So what's new? I was there last time, two years ago, actually, Purim, so two years I wasn't kidding about the food. The, 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 the quality of the meat is much better. <laughs> I know it sounds weird. Things have much higher quality. It's in the water. It's in the water. I saw yesterday at the Kotel, they came the swearing in of new soldiers. I was going to write about it this week. So I'll just share. Uh, the Kotel, they have, they swear them in. I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, knew that that's where they induct them. So they had groups, maybe 2,000 in small groups. I mean, it was like groups of 80. So it was first girls, all kids, basically, 18 years old. It was very moving. It brought me to tears. You know, I was seeing, and they're like, they're good Jews. And they told, you know, they all went to the wall. The girls, I, I was there when they were speaking, the, the guy was speaking to the girl, telling them they have 15 minutes to go to the wall. And it was just uh, to see young, uh, you know, young, young, young kids, really, uh, basically giving their lives to protect their brothers and sisters, they all come to the wall. It's uh, very moving to me. Uh, at the same time, I was thinking, I spoke to one of them. They don't, like, they were never given, they were not given education to really understand why. They have the feeling, but they don't know what to do with it. So there's a lot, all these things are just a very big mix of, of uh, conflict. You know, if you're really open and sensitive to what's going on, it's overwhelmingly, uh, uh, overwhelming the whole situation there. And then when I was there yesterday, there was a guy stabbed, a rabbi stabbed mm-hmm. on the way in the Shar Shechem, the Damascus Gate. Yeah, but no, no, nothing, thank God, nothing serious. But uh, they were telling me that now they're targeting the rabbis and, oh, and the religious, that's right. that's right. which they didn't do before. So it's all, the, all these, the mix of things, it's, uh, then you drive, it's, it's, I mean, look, it's a great place to go and a great place to be and to live and all of that. It's our whole, it's our homeland. So it all comes down to that. But uh, I'm just sharing off the my feelings as I uh, come off of it, and I have to also digest it all. It's, I know, maybe I shouldn't digest it all. I don't know. I just it's just uh, very uh, powerful, can I say? And I feel it's my own, it's my, it's my family's brothers, our brothers and sisters. I mean, though we're in New York, we're just physically here. It's not. It's all one uh, family. And um, above all, is what's going to happen there? I have no clue. Talk about patterns. This is a real uh, complicated one, how to figure out Israel today. You have an um, unbelievable corrupt leadership. And I don't mean just corrupt financially. They have no vision, there's no spirituality, there's no direction. It's a joke, literally a joke. You have a young, I saw the young you know, kids. I saw also they brought a lot of kids from schools, I guess, because of Purim, there's vacation. They bring a lot of schools, Israeli kids. Besides Americans, there's Americans and you know, from Denmark, from Finland, from Mississippi, from Omaha, Nebraska. You have everything. The Christian right. I mean, the buses weren't stopping. The hotel was packed every time I was there. It's, it's happening, which is beautiful in that sense. But I saw. What I was really looking at was the Israeli kids. We're going to public. You know, going to schools, and I see how they the teachers are speaking to them. I, I was listening in. You know, they have microphones. They speak to the kids. So. They, the way they spoke about the Kotel was, I see they don't, they don't know how to communicate. And again, I'm not criticizing any, because they don't know what to say. Like on one hand, they're telling the kids that this is, you want to take a picture, go to the wall, and I can take a picture with the wall. And then the other teacher said, no, tell them it's a holy place, that they could pray. And they don't even know what to say to the kids, and the kids are confused, you know, it's like, so I think everyone's heart's there, and the soul is there, cause, but it's sad to see that they, they don't really 
it, it's like this mixed messages, and there's the secular and the religious. The list goes on. What can I tell you? So when I got, to, I don't get depressed. I'm not a depressed type. But when I get overwhelmed, what do I do? I go to uh, an eat a falafel. <laughs> that for me resolves some of the tension. Delicious. How's that sound? Thank you very much. <laughs> with chips. Their falafel comes with chips, which is French fries. Now, why they're called French fries and French crepes and French uh, twists and French kisses, I don't know, but that's what they call them. We don't want to end with the French, we'll end with the Persians. Everyone have a happy Purim. <laughs> and uh, it should be Shalom and Eretz Yisrael. Peace there and peace everywhere. And we should celebrate in Shalim. Shal Zahav. <laughs> shall have its good triple Purim. I know some people in Shalim are listening to this. So, this my good words to you all. So have a very good Purim there and here. And Ahdus, unity of Jewish people everywhere. Everyone have a very good Purim.